what I would like to do today is, um, you know, basically talk about um, MATLAB and Simulink and how it can be used to, to develop models um, of any systems. And here I'm trying to demonstrate how MATLAB and Simulink can be used for designing an aircraft and how one would go about designing an autopilot for the aircraft. Um, I picked the aerospace example partly because, um, um, like Sai Suma mentioned, I have uh, close to 20 years of experience in this area. And uh, you know, most of my slides kind of reflect my experience dealing with uh, the tool chain and the industry. Um, that is the aerospace industry. So the outline for today's webinar is um, I'm going to uh, dwell on the tool set, you know, a little bit of history and background on um, where we started and where we are today uh, in the last 20 plus years. Um, and how MATLAB and Simulink tool chain uh, gained the popularity uh, followed by the an aircraft example, you know, modeling an aircraft um, in a few slides. Um, it may be overwhelming, but please bear with me. Um, I'll, I'll try to declutter um, the, the modeling aspect. Uh, and then the case study also includes a, a design, autopilot design, what it would take to design an autopilot um, using the MATLAB Simulink uh, tool chain. And uh, I'm also going to touch upon uh, um, what one could expect with the MATLAB Simulink uh, training, you know, because I, I take it, um, you know, all participants uh, are uh, uh, engineering students um, are, you know, in related areas, um, trying to learn about MATLAB and Simulink and see how it can be applied to their own uh, research or development um, when they find the gainful employment. Um, so I would conclude with employment opportunities followed by a quick Q&A. So a little bit history and background on the tools. So like I said, I've been in this area for a good 20 plus years. And um, as I was uh, uh, kind of climbing my ladder, my career ladder, um, I was exposed to a lot of libraries, you know, they were all in Fortran, I'm going to touch upon those, but I just wanted to list uh, what uh, tools, computational tools were available to us, uh, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So the IMSL, uh, IMSL stands for International Mathematical and Statistical Library, you know, mainly for uh, statistical analysis, the entire package. Uh, most of these tools were originally funded. Um, I have provided links for uh, uh, you know interested uh, audience. So they were supported, and they were for the most part they were available as a free, um, freely available code. You know, in, the, in that form on mainframe computers. Then came along NAG numerical algorithms group where the emphasis was more into uh, numerical differentiation, numerical integration, uh, linear algebra computations and eigenvalue solutions among other things. So then there was another contemporary product, uh, Wolfram Technologies called Mathematica. So, so far, we have talked about uh, the IMSL and NAG routines were, uh, were basically for numerical implementations, um, uh, uh, models or analysis. What Wolfram did was uh, they were trying to come up with a product where uh, everything could be done symbolically. Um, so you don't have to keep repeating uh, those computations or derivations. And then when you have a set of parameters, you could quickly uh, turn them on those parameters to find solutions. So 
Then there was another contemporary product, which was uh, looking more like uh, MATLAB Simulink at the time called Matrix X. Uh, Matrix X had an XMath component, which was a scripting language support. And the system build is uh, today's Simulink from MathWorks. And um, the Matrix X product, uh, again, I think in the next few slides, I'm going to go over some additional details. So a little bit on IMSL and NAG. Uh, the routines were originally developed in Fortran and supported on mainframe, like I said before. Uh, I'm sure they have evolved and uh, now they port in C and C++ and also make them available on multiple platforms uh, like PCs. They were originally developed targeting mainframes, but now to compete in the market, they have to port them to different platforms. Mathematica, like I said, it had, it had, uh, it still has a symbolic math solver. Um, again, you can uh, um, come up with solutions uh, for specific cases. Matrix X, um, I just wanted to share this Matrix X story. Uh, Matrix X, X Math system build, like I said, it was similar to MATLAB and Simulink. Um, originally, the product was developed uh, for Solaris and Sun operating systems and on expensive hardware platforms because uh, it was originally funded by International Space Station program. So they didn't really look at uh, marketing the, the product, uh, commercializing the product. Instead, they just developed it and used it for uh, International Space Station design, development, and test because they were uh, adequately funded by the program. They didn't see a revenue generation process. At least it was not critical for them. And then around the same time, um, even MATLAB and Simulink existed. Uh, MATLAB was uh, made into a product in 1984. And then Simulink was added in 1992. Um, and ever since, uh, they, they were developed and marketed by MathWorks. And at the time, Math, 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 MathWorks had, uh, or MATLAB had uh, just two toolboxes, control system toolbox and signal processing toolbox. You know, the, the researchers and engineers behind uh, MATLAB and Simulink, Simulink were, uh, were mainly control system engineers, uh, electrical engineering with electrical engineering background and control systems uh, specialization. Signal processing was an add-on. So what they, what uh, MathWorks did was uh, they collaborated with uh, with the academia because uh, the academia was always focusing on cutting edge solutions. Um, so even the control system toolbox uh, uh, would have uh, taken shape, uh, you know, originally from an academic institute. And then they were, it was embellished to make it part of uh, MathWorks and MATLAB. So, you know, we have seen uh, how Matrix X, uh, or at least just learned that Matrix X did not have a strategy to commercialize this product. And it was cost prohibitive because uh, it was developed um, uh, for high-end platforms uh, that used the Unix operating system. Linux, you know, now Linux, of course. But MathWorks saw an opportunity and they started uh, giving away their product for $99 a piece, you know, while the matrix X would have costed someone like $20,000 a piece. Um, so math, math works. And again, math works did not start from scratch. Um, you know, what we have previously seen, the NAG and IMSL libraries, they were uh, basically open source uh, for most of the engineers and researchers. So, so they started with uh, the open source code that was available in Fortran and started building MATLAB. 
Um, so it was a no brainer. So they tried the packaging things and uh, uh, maybe providing additional uh, details on how these tools could be used, functions could be used. So it really helped um, MathWorks come a long way. So that's essentially a little bit on the history and background. Now let us see where we are with MATLAB today. So, so MATLAB, MathWorks has grown leaps and bounds uh, with a state-of-the-art product set that includes MATLAB and Simulink. They also have a real-time workshop which helps generating C or C++ code from their Simulink blocks. And then they also have an embedded coder. I'm not going to go, go over any embedded coder element today. They have state flow is another uh, uh, component of uh, uh, MATLAB. And then Simscape, they have acquired some of these companies. Simscape uh, has a, has tools or block sets to support. You know, when I say block set, it's basically simulink uh, based block set. So the Simscape product was originally developed um, to as a competitive product for AIMSIM with a lot of uh, uh, support for hydraulics modeling and the power systems. Also, they saw an opportunity, um, so they made the power system design um, as part of Simscape. And in addition, MATLAB, like I said, they also have block sets. Uh, today they have aerospace block set and uh, um, Simscape block set, et cetera. So right now, I mean, though they started in 1982 timeframe with 90 plus tool, I mean, two toolboxes, but today they have grown to 90 plus toolboxes for a variety of applications. They, they have uh, um, machine language, you know, tools for machine language, signal processing, image processing, you name it. And they, they continuously, um, they grow. They continue to grow, teaming up with academia. Anytime there is a new technology out there, they'll try to build a tool set um, to help the students and engineers, researchers. Also the, the MATLAB Simulink uh, platform lends itself to the third party tool set development. So if somebody is trying to develop a cutting edge solution, they could use MATLAB Simulink as the platform and then develop their tools and market them independently. Uh, but the requirement would be that uh, the, I mean, you have a use MATLAB and Simulink environment to use their product. Uh, just to give you, uh, you know, what is the market value of uh, MathWorks today? I mean, in 2019, I have data. In 2019, uh, it was valued at uh, 1.04 billion US dollars. And I used to work for MathWorks you know, way back when. I mean, around 2009 frame, I briefly worked for MathWorks. And at the time, it was valued at 500 million, half billion. So in last uh, 10, 12 years time frame, they have doubled themselves. It is still a privately held company and that's uh, significant uh, for MathWorks. Now, we have just covered how MATLAB and Simulink have evolved. I'm sure other products have evolved, but none of the other products really uh, got to the same level as MATLAB uh, in terms of industrial reach and acceptance. I mean, initially, aerospace and automotive industries have pioneered in the design and rapid prototyping of electronic control units, what we call them, uh, ECUs. So those are the two industries, really. Aerospace industry had a lot of money and they were trying to advance their uh, technologies and bring them to the market as quickly as possible. 
uh, they were initially going from um, mechanical links to fly-by-wire uh, technologies. Automotive, the fly-by-wire is essentially, it's communication, how individual uh, elements, in individual components, uh, subsystems of an aircraft communicate. Um, there was a bus standard called air ink bus standard. They communicate uh, on a redundant bus Similarly, air automotive industry did the same thing. They have uh, CAN bus architecture, they have flex ray architecture. Again, we can, we can really draw parallels between automotive and aerospace industry. So aero, aerospace industry was the brainchild of uh, the innovation and automotive industries uh, in a way tried piggybacking on that technology that's available to them. So as these industries were growing leaps and bounds with uh, you know, incorporating in you know, ICs, um, so that itself has given the push to the tool chain. For example, MATLAB and Simulink and others might have done the same. Um, they started pushing their boundaries, see what else can be done. How, how you know, what else they can do to help these two industries uh, design and deliver quickly with uh, smaller turnaround times. So the third bullet talks about a software development methodology uh, that was evolved uh, from experience and, uh, um, you know, tools available to them, so on and so forth. So, Aerospace industry, you know, I'll, I'll, I have a slide for V model. I'll try to give you a little more detail there. Um, but the V model, there are a couple of precursors to the V model. You know, there was a software development. Uh, I mean, the reason why we talk about software development methodology is because uh, now you have ECUs and you have to uh, install piece of code and test the hardware in the loop um, before you deliver the product. So, so they needed a, a software design uh, methodology, so to speak. So the aerospace industry had always used uh, waterfall. Uh, I'm, I'm sure aerospace and the software industry have a lot of things in common. Uh, the waterfall had its own drawbacks. So they started adopting a spiral uh, software development model. You know, the way the spiral essentially identifies individual subsystems and the interfaces, you know, are try, they, they, try, they try to solidify the interface uh, with experience and uh, what the uh, new innovation might call for. Once the interface ICD, what we typically call it, interface control document, once somebody had uh, uh, fleshed out the interfaces, then uh, one could put more meat uh, in, the, in the individual subsystems. That's where the spiral as it was unwinding are going from the innermost uh, layer to the outermost layer the fidelity of the models were going higher and higher without changing the interface. At which point you just go through a series of uh, releases, you know, at different stages of the product development. I'm, I'm sure some of you uh, know how a product uh, is it designed and uh, developed and tested. So you have um, somebody, you know, scribbles on a piece of paper, and take it through uh, a proof of concept stage and then um, the prototype it and uh, kind of very validity. You know, you make sure the technology supports it and it's cost effective and it's profitable. Ultimately, any product will have to be profitable. It should re you know, generate revenue uh, for the company to sustain and make more products. So ultimately, you know, the waterfall spiral, all those uh, have culminated in the V model. So it, as, as of today, the V model has been practiced um, widely by 
the you know aerospace and automotive industries. So what MathWorks realized was um, uh, again uh, MathWorks uh, was trying to grow leaps and bounds as always, and it has um, seen the opportunity, and they started uh, acquiring a few companies here and there. Uh, Speedgoat is one such company. I, I forgot where Speedgoat is from. It is a it's a Swiss company, if I'm not mistaken. You know, to help them with uh, real time support. You know, Math MathLab Simulink they generate real time code, um, and it can be ported to the Speedgoat hardware based on uh, your 486, which is our standard PC platforms, we call them the X486 models. You could port and quickly uh, test them, test the code. So that's that's the industrial reach and acceptance. So once the MATLAB MathWorks tool chain has become industry standard, uh, it was much easier for the industry to, to take it and run with it. So that kind of covers the history and background of uh, various uh, tool chains and where uh, MATLAB and Simulink are positioned today. So I'm going to go over in this slide, um, um, you know, how one would go about uh, designing an autopilot. For a business jet, there's no reason why I picked business jet. It could be just any aircraft. Uh, maybe because I briefly worked for uh, uh, Gulfstream, which is uh, an aerospace company that uh, that makes business jets, so I was kind of excited to include that as an example. Um, so, an aircraft. I mean, if you think about an aircraft, uh, I mean, I picked aircraft again to show uh, different uh, complexities. You know, it, it's more than complexity; it's highly involved to come up with a a mathematical model for design purposes is involved because uh, it has uh, uh, six degrees of freedom. So I'll go from the left corner and I'll just quickly go over each component of an aircraft. So as we all know, the aircraft aircrafts operate in uh, in atmosphere, which is you know which is full of air, and air is a fluid. Uh, provides the aerodynamics forces uh, environment needed for the aircraft to fly. Um, the aircraft is equipped with the sensors and actuators. Uh, so let's uh, talk about sensors. Uh, I mean, there is, we have uh, underlying uh, dynamics, you know, aircraft by itself is a rigid mass and when a rigid mass is subjected to a rigid body, uh, when a rigid body is subjected to forces, um, so you have, uh, uh, you know, when, I, when you apply forces to the rigid body, you start seeing its uh, motion, basically. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so inherently, uh, an aircraft uh, is treated to have a six degrees of freedom. Uh, the reason being, so it has, uh, I mean, if you in a three-dimensional space, we normally represent three-dimensional space with the uh, X, Y, and Z axis, which means there are three degrees of freedom there. So the aircraft can uh, move translationally along X, Y, and Z axis, or it can also rotate by virtue of its uh, being airborne, it, it can rotate about X axis, Y axis, and Z axis. So there are three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom that makes it six. So, and, and the, the equations of motion are generic. Uh, what makes the equations different uh, from aircraft to aircraft uh, is basically the parameters. You know the size, what control surfaces you have, what are the sizes of the control surfaces, what uh, propulsive device you have. You know aircrafts need uh, engines to generate forward thrust. 
Um, here I'm showing a two engine configuration. You know, you also might have seen a single engine configuration mounted on the tail. So there are all kinds of configurations and uh, one needs to build a model before a design can be thought about. So going back to the details of the slide. So we talked about uh, the aircraft, the rigid body dynamics, which has six degrees of freedom. And then the aircraft is equipped with all kinds of sensors. At a minimum, it needs to have an inertial measurement unit that has accelerometers and uh, gyros to measure accelerations and uh, rotational body velocities. It needs an air data sensor to determine the speed of its, its own self. And uh, it also has an altimeter, which I'm not showing here. The altimeter determines or measures the altitude, uh, how far away you are from the ground. Uh, that's another sensor. And now speaking of controls, so you the aircraft is equipped with uh, all kinds of control surfaces. You have ailerons, to help the aircraft roll. When you deflect the ailerons, the aircraft will, the, the ailerons will generate rolling moment. And you have elevators as shown in the, in the picture. Um, elevator will allow the aircraft to pitch up and pitch down. That is about the, the Y axis. Uh, I mean, if you can picture an X, Y, Z axis, that is the body fixed. Uh, X axis going through the nose, Y axis to the left, to the wing, and uh, Z axis going down. You know, it completes the right hand rule. Um, rudder, rudder provides the yaw control, uh, which is about the Z axis. So the, the control surface is at a distance from the center of mass or the center of gravity which provide, you know, when you deflect the, deflect any of these surfaces, you end up in getting a moment. Uh, there is a moment arm from the CG, and when you deflect um, the aerodynamic force uh, caused by the deflection will generate that moment. So let's move on. Um, 